This is Public Resource. Hello, I'm Carl Malamud. On today's multicast, we're going to look at the question of jury instructions written by judges and used in the trial courts of the United States. And more specifically, we're going to look at what Public Resource did to make the Wisconsin jury instructions more widely available. But what are jury instructions? Let's ask the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia teaches us that jury instructions are the set of legal rules governing how jurors should behave when deciding a case, often addressing with whom jurors may discuss the case and how jurors will decide who is guilty. Jury instructions are given to the jury by the judge, who usually reads them aloud to the jury. The judge issues a judge's charge to inform the jury how to act in deciding a case. Most states have what are called model jury instructions. When a judge is trying a particular kind of case, say drunk driving, they consult these model jury instructions for what they should tell the jury. The model instructions might be modified a bit based on the circumstances, but they are the baseline, the starting point that every judge and lawyer must consult. In many cases, including the great state of Wisconsin, these model instructions are created by the Judicial Conference. The Wisconsin Judicial Conference is an arm of the Wisconsin Judiciary, and it is run by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The Supreme Court appoints trial court and appellate judges to the jury instruction committees, and these judges work together to create the model jury instructions. What makes Wisconsin a bit unusual is that they've partnered with the University of Wisconsin Law School, which acts as staff to the committees. The final decisions are all made by sitting judges appointed by the Supreme Court, but then at the end of the day, the law school sells these official government documents. The price isn't cheap. They cost $510 for a set, plus fees for updates, and the instructions are carefully guarded from public view. You can't view them online. Even in the libraries, use is carefully restricted. And once you've put your $510 down, these jury instructions come festooned with copyright assertions and various other admonishments. Public Resource set out to change that situation. On June 1, we sent a letter to the honorable judges and to the law school folks that assist them and then sell the documents. And here's what we said. Dear Judge Ellers, Judge Schumacher, Judge Perez, Mr. Pearson, and Professor Schultz, I am writing to inform you that my organization, Public Resource, a 501c3 nonprofit corporation based in California, has recently purchased a set of the Wisconsin jury instructions, and we plan to make those materials publicly available. I want to give you an opportunity to respond and raise any facts or issues you believe are relevant. Specifically, We have purchased from Continuing Legal Education Wisconsin of the University of Wisconsin School of Law the following materials for the sum of $510, the Wisconsin jury instructions for children's courts, civil courts, and for criminal courts. These Wisconsin jury instructions contain, quote, over 1,000 jury instructions to assist judges, lawyers, and most importantly, jurors in understanding what the jury must decide at the conclusion of the trial, end quote. The author of each of these sets of jury instructions is a standing committee of the Wisconsin Judicial Conference, which was established by Supreme Court Rule 7015. The three standing committees were established under Article 5, Section 1 of the Bylaws of the Conference. Each volume carries a notice that the publisher is Continuing Legal Education, University of Wisconsin Law School, an ISBN number, and a number of copyright notices in the name of the Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin. In addition to the standard copyright page in the front matter, Every line of the table of contents contains a separate copyright symbol and date, and every page of each volume bears a footer with the copyright symbol and the words Regents, University of Wisconsin. Mr. Pearson, the latest in a long and distinguished line of reporters, states that, quote, 
each of the three sets of jury instructions published by the law school share the same objective. They strive for a careful blending of the substantive law and the collective wisdom and courtroom experiences of the committee members. End quote. The criminal and civil instructions have been published for 60 years, the children's instructions for 27. The voting members of the committees are all sitting judges appointed by the Judicial Conference. The judges take primary responsibility for the program. As Associate Dean David Schultz said, quote, because the giving of instructions is uniquely a judicial function and one about which the judiciary has the most knowledge and experience. As Professor Schultz has also said, an important aspect of the project's trial judge orientation is that the instructions are not approved by anyone other than the Committee of Trial Judges." End quote. The genesis for the original Committee on Civil Instructions came from Judge Andrew W. Parnell, a circuit court judge of the 10th Judicial Circuit from 1952 to 1972, who contributed thousands of hours of labor to their creation. Judge Parnell's purpose in creating this effort was to further, quote, the ideal of progress and improvement in the judicial administration of our state, end quote. The original committees were ably assisted by Mr. John Conway, who served as editor from 1960 to 1980. While serving as the reporter to the committees, John Conway also wrote a number of private books, which were bestsellers for Clue. In addition to being a professor at the school, he also served as the reviser of statutes for the state of Wisconsin. He also served on the Legislative Council and helped draft the Statutory Judicial Council. Mr. Conway and the others that have served as reporters after him embody the Wisconsin idea. As Professor Marigold S. Malley said in a tribute to Professor Conway, whenever anyone mentions the Wisconsin idea, that proud motto which describes the commitment of the University of Wisconsin academic community to involvement in the life of its state, I think of John Conway. The current system is based on what began as an informal partnership between Clue and the trial court judges. In that arrangement, as the preface to the 1978 supplement states, the Extension Law Department would be the sponsor and publisher with all rights and profits reserved to it on its moral commitment that the prospect of profits, if any, would be employed by it to the furtherance of better judicial administration in our state. While the current system has served Wisconsin well, I believe the lack of public availability of these Wisconsin jury instructions is not compatible with the mission and purpose of the committees appointed by the Judicial Conference, particularly the study of, quote, particular subjects appertaining to the administration of justice and its improvement, end quote. The work of the three jury instructions committees is conducted by sitting judges in the course of their official duties as part of an overall commitment to, as Justice Connor T. Hansen said, to further the maintenance of an independent and strongly functioning system of courts. Justice Hansen said that whatever we do to strengthen the courts strengthens America. It is a long-held common law doctrine that work produced by judges as part of their official duties is not eligible for copyright. This edicts of government doctrine goes back to the golden age of the Marshall Court in the 1834 case of Wheaton v. Peters, where it was held that, quote, the court is unanimously of opinion that no reporter has or can have any copyright in the written opinions delivered by this court and that the judges thereof cannot confer on any reporter any such right." End quote. The U.S. Supreme Court further elaborated on the Edicts of Government Doctrine when it stated that no copyright may be obtained by a judge and that this principle extends to whatever work they perform in their capacity as judges. The court has recently considered the Edicts of Government Doctrine in the recent case of the State of Georgia versus public.resource.org, in which my organization prevailed after being sued by the State of Georgia 
for having purchased and posted the official Code of Georgia annotated. Chief Justice Roberts stated, quote, the Copyright Act grants potent, decades-long monopoly protection for original works of authorship. The question in this case is whether that protection extends to the annotations contained in Georgia's official annotated code. We hold that it does not. Over a century ago, we recognized a limitation on copyright protection for certain government work product rooted in the Copyright Act's authorship requirement. Under what has been dubbed the Government Edicts Doctrine, officials empowered to speak with the force of law cannot be the authors of, and therefore cannot copyright, the works they create in the course of their official duties. We have previously applied that doctrine to hold that non-binding, explanatory legal materials are not copyrightable when created by judges who possess the authority to make and interpret the law. See Banks v. Manchester, 1888, end quote. After carefully studying the Wisconsin jury instructions and their history, it appears that they fall squarely within the boundaries of the Edicts of Government doctrine. It is also my opinion that making these materials more broadly available to the public would further the stated goals of the creation of these Wisconsin jury instructions and would contribute to the administration of justice by informing lawyers, law students, citizens, and judges of these important documents in different and more accessible formats. The profuse assertions of copyright throughout the materials do not seem compatible with what the U.S. Copyright Office calls a long-standing public policy that such materials are not eligible for registration. We believe the proper course of action would be for the Wisconsin Judicial Conference to waive all copyright and other restrictions and make the materials freely available. But even if Clue decides to make the first instance of the Wisconsin jury instructions available only for a fee and in hard copy, I believe that the Edicts of Government Doctrine would permit, indeed encourage, our right to speak these Edicts of Government by making them available in different ways and formats, a right which we intend to exercise. Out of respect for the Wisconsin Judicial Conference and the 60 years of public service the University of Wisconsin has carried out in assisting the courts in this task, I am writing today to inform the committees of our intentions to post these materials, making them available in electronic form on the internet without charge to users. We will not do so for a period of 60 days in order to allow the committees to inform us of any factors or circumstances we might have overlooked. We would be happy to discuss this matter with you and would of course be delighted to assist the Wisconsin Judicial Conference and the University of Wisconsin Law School if you wish to take steps towards making the materials more broadly available. I believe we all share a commitment towards common goals. The system in place today has served Wisconsin well, and I am struck by the words of Professor Schultz when he said, quote, one of the goals of the university is the pursuit of the Wisconsin idea, the idea that a public university ought to reach out to the people of the state and assist state government in serving the people, end quote. We should also keep in mind the words of United States Supreme Court Justice Wiley Rutledge, who said, the essence of the Wisconsin idea has been looking forward, not backward, in the art of democratic living. I believe it is now time to look forward on the subject of Wisconsin jury instructions and hope you will agree with me that some changes in the way these important edicts of government are distributed are in order. I look forward to hearing from you and thank you in advance for your attention to this matter. Respectfully yours, Carl Malamud for Public Resource. That was the letter that Public Resource sent on June 1. Before we get to what happened when Wisconsin got our letter, you might be asking, do these jury instructions really matter? Aren't there more important things to worry about? 
Let's see what these instructions actually say. Members of the jury, before the trial begins, there are certain instructions you should have to better understand your functions as a juror and how you should conduct yourself during the trial. Your duty is to decide the case based only on the evidence presented at trial and the law given to you by the court. Anything you may see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence. Do not let any personal feelings about race, religion, national origin, sex, or age affect your consideration of the evidence. And now it comes down to you, the jury. Jurors, we have now come to the part of the trial where you will begin your active functions as jurors. First, I would like to emphasize what I said to you before. Please do not communicate with anyone concerning this case. The judge will instruct you as to how the law applies to this case, and you will retire to deliberate. During the deliberation, all you need to be a good juror is an open mind, fairness, the ability to reconsider your opinion, and common sense. Were the witnesses telling the truth? Was the evidence credible? What are the actual facts of the case as you see them? Remember, your opinion is equal to anyone else in the jury room. Once the jury reaches its verdict, the court will hear it. But do these instructions matter to practicing lawyers in Wisconsin? We asked a prominent criminal attorney in Wisconsin about these jury instructions, and here's what he had to say. I am speaking with Chad Lanning of Lubar and Lanning. He's a criminal defense lawyer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so Chad, you show up in, in trial court a lot, right? That's part of your job? That's what I enjoy most about my job. Yeah, what kind of cases do you do? Um, I do criminal defense, so that ranges from traffic cases and speeding tickets all the way up to uh, drunk driving and um, serious drug charges and sexual assaults. Uh, across the board, I really do handle it all. And how important are jury instructions in the process of this, this litigation in a trial court? You cannot understate how important jury instructions are. I can tell you when I first got a job, uh, uh, out of law school doing criminal defense, I got a list of things that I needed to read to make sure I knew before I even talked to a client. And, on a, and the first thing on the list was a series of jury instructions that I should know and understand. Um, you know, the jury instructions are there to protect the average citizen from dubious and unjust convictions and decisions. And that's the starting point. And everyone should have them and, and understand them before they would ever go anywhere near a jury trial. So there are model jury instructions for Wisconsin. Could you just make up your own and hand them to a judge and say, please tell the jury to do this? What would a judge do? That's a very good question. Absolutely, you could. You could go in and say, this is what I think uh, it means to touch someone in a sexual manner. And in those cases, judge, judges should consider those. But what happens most often in Wisconsin is a judge will just simply say, you know what, I think the standard instruction is good enough for the committee. It's good enough for me. I'm not going to deviate from that standard instruction. And so the judge would be dubious if you wanted to use your own instructions. He might not say no, but, but he would or she would want a good reason, right? That's right. You'd have to really lay out the reasons for any change to the standard jury instruction. And are the standard jury instructions good? Are they, are they well done? Do they serve your purposes as, as a litigator? Well, I think they're great starting points, but I don't think they should ever be endpoints unless it really fits all the facts of your particular case. But unfortunately, I think too many people view standard jury instructions as endpoints, and I think they should be starting points. But they should always be used as a starting point, if nothing else, and then potentially modified. Absolutely. And how do you access the model jury instructions? Do you subscribe and pay for them? Do you go to a library? Um, well, there's a couple of things that I do. Um, you know, jury instructions, um, uh, you know, come at a cost here in Wisconsin. And that's just not for copies. It's, you know, actual cost above and beyond what it would cost to copy something. And, uh, you know, I've made the decision in my practice to not update them every year. Um, but I follow the law regularly. I read all the updates. I know what changes are. Um, but I'll go to my jury instructions, and then I'll reach out to lawyers that I know and um, ask if there's been any changes, if, 
if I think there has been any. But the, the, so you're the kind trust of, doesn't change too much from year to year. So you're kind of pooling. You're 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 hoping one of your colleagues has got the current stuff and you've got the older stuff. Uh, I've done that before. I have. Yeah. And um, besides litigators like yourself, are these jury instructions of use to? law students or to citizens or who else might use these things? Um, well, obviously you hit people that all use them. Um, and quite frankly, I think it should be much more widely available just for the public to be informed what it is um, on any particular topic. You know, what is it to be disorderly? You know, what would, what would it take for me to be charged with disorderly conduct? Some people might think it takes an actual fight. Um, it doesn't. It can be loud and boisterous conduct. Um, and the jury instructions really lay things out in much more common language than you might find in a statute in a law book. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Chad Lanning with the firm of Lubar and Lanning in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for talking with me today. That was Chad Lanning, who is a Wisconsin lawyer who first brought this situation to my attention. Thank you, Chad. Here's what happened with Wisconsin. We sent the letter in on June 1. After we didn't hear anything back for a week, I pinged the professors at the law school just to make sure they got it. I didn't hear back from the professors, but I did get a note from Nancy K. Lynch, the assistant vice provost for legal affairs of the University of Wisconsin, asking me to only communicate with her in the future. The law professors had turned the matter over to their lawyers, and I didn't hear anything at all from the judges. In our letter, we asked for a reply in 60 days, which would have been August 1. Just before that deadline, I sent Ms. Lynch email and asked her if she was going to answer us and if perhaps, given the huge amount of work the lawyers must be facing trying to decide how to reopen their university this fall, did she need a bit more time? Ms. Lynch thanked me, said another month would be very helpful. No problem. I was happy to grant an extension. On September 1, we got a letter back from the university. Ms. Lynch said they were getting out of the jury instructions business because they wouldn't do it unless they had a revenue stream. But she also said that the Wisconsin Judicial Conference would make sure that these jury instructions were available for free and that this transition would take a bit of time. Would we mind holding off until February 1? Now, there's no reason for public resource to wait until February 1, and we were certainly ready to post on September 1. But we always believe in encouraging organizations to do the right thing, and making the instructions online for free is totally the right thing, so I agreed that we'd wait until February 1. How is the Wisconsin Judicial Conference going to make these available on February 1? We don't know. There's always the possibility that they will wrap these behind a terms of use agreement or play games like the standards group do of making them available on a so-called read-only site, which prohibits printing, searching, and bookmarking, not accessible to the visually impaired. But we're willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and hold our fire. The letter from Ms. Lynch also did a bit of saber rattling, saying that Wisconsin felt confident about their chances in court should they decide to sue us. According to them, the U.S. Supreme Court decision against Georgia didn't really apply to the Wisconsin situation because there was no work-for-hire contract between the law school and the Supreme Court. Is the Wisconsin situation for model jury instructions totally different from the Georgia decision about annotated legislative codes? Let's see what one of the leading intellectual property lawyers in the country and somebody who has represented public resource for many years has to say about this. I'm speaking with Corinne McSherry, who is the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, thanks for timing, uh, taking the time to speak with me, Corinne. My pleasure, absolutely. So I wanted to speak to you about the uh, Wisconsin jury instruction situation. Uh, did you get a chance to read the letter back from the university to me? I did, yes. 
Um, so Ms. Lynch uh, is from the university's uh, general counsel staff. She's the assistant vice provost. And she said there were two critical differences between the Wisconsin situation and the Georgia decision. And I'd like to ask you about both of those. Uh, the first is that she pointed out that there's no formal agreement between the university and the Wisconsin judiciary. There's no work for hire agreement. And that was a critical difference with the Georgia case. Was the presence of the Lexus work for a higher contract an important part of the Georgia decision? So I think that what the Georgia decision really turns on is something a little bit different from that. I think what, what the Supreme Court was acknowledging in that decision and following its own precedent going back many, many decades, even hundreds of years, depending on how you count it, um, what they're really focused in on is is the work an edict of government or not? Is it something that um, is basically has the imprimatur of the government or or not? And um, and that's sort of the key distinction. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because um, hopefully everyone knows this, but in case they don't, I have a sad truth to reveal to you, which is that many many laws that we rely upon um, that have become, you know that are laws are drafted by lobbyists. They're drafted by private organizations. They're drafted by private people all over the place. And, and then they're submitted to legislators to consider and, and they may consider them and then they may adopt them into law, right? And then they become laws. The fact that th their origin isn't really the key to the question. The question is, has this been adopted into law? Has this been made into made into a regulation that has to be followed? And if so, and it's got government force behind it, it's an edict of government, and you have to think about it differently. So the origin story of all of these works really isn't the key question. So the second critical difference that she pointed out um, was that they did all the work at the law school. And I kind of pushed back a little bit on that and I said, well, listen, you know, according to the preface to the instructions, the judges really worked hard and had the final say. But even if the university had done all the work, isn't the fact that the judges are the authors, they are the ones on the committee and they're all sitting judges, is, isn't that the dispositive thing? Not, not who did the work? Well, to me, actually, the way I think about it is that ultimately the authors are the people. The authors are the public, right? The, and there's, again, Supreme Court language to this effect that, you know, the, the judges are the authors of the work, but also the people are the authors of the work because um, it's, um, you know, sort of becomes a, a public obligation. And whenever that happens, then, you know, the citizens become the authors of the work. Whoever, no matter who actually held the pen, um, that's not the question. The question is, is this something that has become a government work? And if it has, um, through a variety of different means that this can happen, once that happens, then the people are the authors. The people are the authors of the law at the end of the day, um, including, you know, Supreme Court opinions. I mean, Supreme Court clerks write those things. We know that. Um, justices write them too. But ultimately, the Supreme Court opinions are not, um, or, or, you know, uh, part of a public body of works. And that's as it should be, because we have a country where, you know, we are a country that, that follows the rule of law. And if you have that country, which hopefully we're going to keep having it <laughs> for, for many uh, centuries to come, in that context, People always have to have access to the law. And I, I think it's very important that we not lose sight of that sort of fundamental principle and get bogged down in, you know, tiny little things, again, that come back to the origin stories. The key principle is that in a country ruled by law and various kinds of regulations and so on, people need to have access to that. That's crucial so that we can hold government bodies accountable, so we can hold judges accountable, we can hold regulators accountable. And if we don't have free access, free as in free in all of the senses, um, then the people can hold their governmental um, um, bodies accountable. And that's really what's supposed to be underlying this entire question. Okay, thank you very much, Corinne. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. It's very much my pleasure. 
Corinne McSherry is the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I'm proud that Corinne has been public resources attorney for many years, representing us before the U.S. District Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals. EFF is an amazing organization, and I hope you'll consider supporting their efforts. This multicast has been all about jury instructions. We're using them to highlight what we do at Public Resource and why that matters. Jury instructions are edicts of government, and we think that makes them important. Jury instructions matter. Jury instructions are perhaps a small cog, but they are part of the gears that keep the wheels of justice spinning. In a democracy, Citizens must have access to edicts of government. You can't have rule of law if you can't read the law. If you can't speak the law to inform your fellow citizens of their rights and their obligations. If we are all ignorant of the law, our system of government cannot function, and there is no excuse for that. In a democracy, the law belongs to the people, not to the public servants that are carrying out their official duties on our behalf. The law is a public domain. Despite that clear principle, several jurisdictions, especially Wisconsin and California, have put bizarre fences around their jury instructions, maintaining control, extracting rent, imposing conditions of use, and making it clear that you should keep off the grass. We had these jury instructions before that initial letter went out on June 1. I made a point of carefully looking at these materials before questioning the authority of the state of Wisconsin to tell me to keep off that grass. We could have had easily posted these documents. The Georgia decision is so directly on point when it comes to judges carrying out their official duties, I had no legal worries on that account. Why not just scan and post before sending the letter? Indeed, why send the letter at all? Why give the other side all this advance notice? Confronting authority is an art, not a science. It is a practical art. Civil resistance and questioning authority are age-old practices, and the tools of the trade have been used in the most mundane matters of our daily lives to the monumental struggles for dignity and freedom and justice and equality over the centuries by such giants as Mahatma Gandhi, Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King Jr., Aruna Roy, Nelson Mandela, and so many more. If you read the history of these struggles, there are some rules and techniques and strategies that we can all learn. We try and practice those at public resource. One rule is you always telegraph your moves. You don't sneak around. You have to be upright and forthright in your actions. Before Gandhi went to make salt, he sent a letter to the Viceroy telling His Royal Highness why he was going to make salt and how he was going to make the salt and why he believed he had right on his side. He famously started that letter, Dear Friend, which was a bit cheeky as a form of address when communicating with the august viceregal presence. Gandhi, of course, also taught us that you should love people even if you disagree with them, even if they are threatening you. He taught us that once you win the fight, you shouldn't move the goalposts. The idea is not to exact a price from the people you confront. The goal is to affect change, to move the ball forward, to see a better system put in place. It was thus with great pleasure that I told the University of Wisconsin that I look forward to their February release. And we are, of course, happy to wait and happy to assist if they should so desire. We're not backing off here. The Wisconsin jury instructions are scanned and ready. But the end goal wasn't that we post the Wisconsin jury instructions. That was simply a step. The goal is that these instructions become unencumbered so that this sluice of knowledge can be set aflowing. I spent the last several years on the road making frequent and extended visits to my colleagues, particularly in India. Public Resource runs one of the largest public libraries of books about and from India on the internet. We have law firms all over the world that represent us pro bono, and we have played an important role in civil resistance in the fields of edicts of government, access to knowledge, and text and data mining. But in early March, like the rest of the world, my life changed. I cut a 30-day trip in India short after just three days. Travel, 
speeches, conferences, even beers in a bar with new colleagues. None of that was possible anymore. It has been a long time since I've practiced multicasting, but this seems like the right time to take it up again. In these programs, of which the Wisconsin Jury Instructions is the first, I'm hoping to be able to continue that conversation with you here on the internet about the work we do, why it matters, and the lessons we've learned. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. For Public Resource, this is Carl Malamud. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. Additional support provided by Alexander McGillivray. The El Baz Family Foundation. Cyrus Capital Partners. The Kale Austin Foundation. Stuart Butterfield, Justia, and from contributions from citizens like you. Thank you for your support. Our work at Public Resource would not be possible without pro bono legal support from some of the best lawyers in the world. Many thanks to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The leading nonprofit defending digital privacy, free speech, and innovation for 30 years. EFF. Many thanks also to Fenwick and West, Goldstein and Russell, Morrison and Forster, the Chambers of Fred P. Logue. The Chambers of Sri Saman Kursid. The Chambers of Sri Jabahar Raja. Mr. David Halperin. Calliope Law. Duri Tangri. Davis Wright Tremaine. We thank these fine lawyers for their dedication to the rule of law. Public Resource is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation with headquarters in the state of California and dedicated to the principle that access to knowledge is a human right.